El mundo está olvidando las ideas de la libertad. No solamente en México, lo estamos viendo en muchos lugares del mundo. Gobiernos que están empezando a promover ideas autoritarias o una mayor intervención del gobierno en la economía o en la vida social. Eh, hay algunas instituciones, sin embargo, como el Mises Institute de los Estados Unidos, que nos ofrecen las ideas de la libertad, que nos mandan una advertencia acerca de los riesgos que corre una sociedad que olvida las libertades individuales. Quiero agradecer a Jeff Deist, presidente del Mises Institute de los Estados Unidos, su presencia aquí en este programa. Jeff, thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you. Uh, there's uh, a lot of people now believe that you, we don't need freedom, or we don't need to have uh, economic freedom or personal freedoms because the government uh, does things much better if we don't try to exercise our freedom. What, what do you tell them? Yeah, it's interesting. There is a lot of growing support for socialism, I think, especially amongst the under 40 mm -hmm. generation in the West. And it, there's a certain allure to it, Yes. right, uh, that we can collectively do what we can't do individually, which is live at the expense of tomorrow and borrow money and just pay for all kinds of things because they sound good, like uh, universal health care mm -hmm. or uh, pensions or universal basic income and all of these kinds of things. So it really is an educational effort. I, I fear very strongly that we have dumbed down our younger people to the extent where they aren't reading a lot of books, they aren't reading a lot of history. Why, why is it uh, the young people? Because one would always expect the young to be rebellious. One mm -hmm. would expect the young to uh, treasure freedom more than other people. You know, maybe the old people want to have a, a government take care of them. But the young, why the young? Isn't that interesting that today uh, being a libertarian is more rebellious than being a socialist <laughs> in a lot of ways? It, yeah. Because the baby boomers who are mostly running things in the West Uh, are, are kind of a mixture of semi-socialism. So I think that young people aren't to blame. Uh, th their ideas will evolve. But what we have to understand is they're growing up in an era where a uh, college degree doesn't necessarily get them a good job. Mm -hmm. They might have a lot of debt. That debt might prevent them from buying a house or marrying. Uh, they might look at their parents, their baby boomer parents, and say, well, you had the same job for 30 years. You had a pension. You'll get Social Security. None of those things are available to me, necessarily, if I'm 21 years old today. So we have to give them a little bit of credit that they're looking at this and searching for something new. So it's our job to make sure that that something new isn't something old called socialism. Um, who was Ludwig von Mises? Why is the Institute called the Mises Institute? How important was he? Well, it's very important, a giant of the 20th century, not only in economics, but in sociology and political theory. But like a lot of men, Uh, he didn't really get his due until after he died. Mm. So we could all hope for that, I guess, that we'll have some posthumous uh, valor. But he, he, what he really understood was that economics is a social science. It, it, it ought not to have the same methods as physical sciences like uh, physics or chemistry. In other words, humans act, and they can often be irrational creatures. They can do all kinds of things, and they're motivated by all kinds of things. And so we have to study them and understand human nature to understand economics. We can't just uh, test hypotheses using empirical data like we might in physics. You called yourself a libertarian. What is a libertarian and what is a liberal? Well, to me, a libertarian in the political sense of the word mm -hmm. is just someone who wants to see government severely restricted. Just like classical liberalism. Just like classical liberalism in that mm -hmm. sense. In other words, to allow social society, civil society, and free markets to, to work to create prosperity and also to deal with a lot of the social ills that we currently think government only can deal with, like housing and poverty and health care and food. Uh, so to me, a libertarian in the political sense is just someone who wants to see the private sector flourish and, and government to be severely restrained. The United States was for a long time the libertarian country, the country mm -hmm. that respected human liberty or the various uh, economic and personal liberties. But mm -hmm. uh, there seems to be a change, at least over the, over the past few years. What's happening in the U.S.? Well, uh, historically, the United States has talked a better game uh, about liberty than it's actually walked. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's never been as libertarian or as free as we might like it. But for a, a long period, especially in the 1800s, It, just the vastness of the country made it difficult for a central government to logistically uh, ha have much impact on people. But today, we find that the, the battle of ideas is the most important one. So it's not, it's not so much the state that we're fighting or the bad policies of government. It's more the ideas that later in life create support 
for that. That's our challenge. Uh, once ever so often, a uh, ruler in Latin America starts uh, experimenting with mm -hmm. socialism or with other authoritarian regimes. Uh, you know, we had the uh, Castro regime for a long time mm -hmm. in Cuba. Now we see Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. And uh, a lot of people in Mexico and a lot of people in Latin America consider a country like Venezuela as a role model. What's your opinion? Well, it's, it's certainly not a role model for anybody at, at the moment. Uh, a lot of people are looking to the West. They're looking to the United States to intervene, maybe, in Venezuela and to, to oust Maduro, to recognize the assembly leader as the president. I think that's a bad idea. I think the United States has a very poor track record in Latin America. I also think the United States is, is, is at this point not in a position morally uh, to be dictating to other countries how they ought to organize themselves politically because we have a lot of very serious problems in the United States. Uh, what should be done? Uh, should, should people in Latin America t take a lesson from that? I, I can't really say. It's, it's, it's not for me to say. But w what we do know is that people need markets. They need mm -hmm. a certain amount of material prosperity. Uh, re regardless of your ideology. And if, and if you can't provide that, and, and oil alone at $53 per barrel is certainly not going to provide that, uh, you're, you're going to have big problems. So if we, if we can't necessarily reach people on some deep ideological level, then we have to at least address th their material concerns, which we know are improved by markets. Jeff, what do you tell people uh, that tell you that uh, markets are heartless? Well, I, I think markets are just a reflection of human beings. Markets are imperfect. They're, they're just sort of the aggregate of human action. Uh, every day in Mexico City, millions and millions and millions of people get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. And we know that they are, at least in some sense, economic actors. They hope to improve their, their lives. They hope to, to be better off materially, maybe spiritually, uh, maybe uh, intellectually uh, by, by the end of their lives. So there's nothing sinister. There's nothing uh, heartless. There's nothing... Um, unfathomable about markets. It's just the sum total of, of what human beings ought to do. And as long as they're not hurting each other, as long as they're not acting in predatory or uh, violent or fraudulent ways, I think there's a lot of wisdom in allowing them uh, to, to do what they wish to do it and, and having a spillover effect of prosperity. Jeff, what are the freest countries in the world and what mm. lessons do they teach us? That's a tough question because you've got economic freedom and then you have political freedom, which okay. don't always go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. In a place like Dubai or Singapore, you have quite a bit of economic freedom, but politically uh, they, they can be very strict. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you, you don't get to chew gum. <laughs> you, you don't get to, to, to litter. They can, they can have some harsh cri criminal penalties. Uh, I, I really love the Swiss model. I think mm -hmm. their, their uh, process of really distinct subsidiarity. Mm -hmm. pushing every decision to the most local level down to what they call the communes, the cities, mm -hmm. but if not at the communal level, at the canton, the state mm -hmm. level. And only at the last resort is, are things handled at the federal level, which is basically money and, and military defense. So I think if you believe in democracy, it, it works best at the very, very local level. So, I, so for, for, as a political model, I love Switzerland. Uh, a lot of people are surprised to see that Switzerland doesn't have a minimum wage, for example. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's the lesson from that? The yeah. lesson is but, that but they have very good salaries. <laughs> the lesson is that Switzerland's rich, mm -hmm. <laughs> and nobody's worried about any sort of minimum wage because people are doing well for the most part. Uh, a, a minimum wage is just is just a price control. It's it's no different than telling you, let's say you have your uh, you're getting a new car, you want to sell mm -hmm. your old one. And, and for the government to pass a law that says you can't sell it for less than X. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if we think about it that way, it, it can't make any sense. So, so what we ought to be focused on more, I think, is prosperity and, and lifting people up an opportunity instead of constantly uh, t trying to figure out how we're going to manage, uh, the, you know, uh, helping the less affluent. Um, the, uh, the states you, you've told us is a country that... Um, has claimed to be liberal, classical liberal, libertarian, but hasn't actually fulfilled its, uh, uh, hasn't met its use. It's not as, as libertarian as, as they claim to be. What are the faults of the states? What, what are they doing wrong? What they could be doing better? Well, the United States is a perfect example of a state that has not lived up to its own constitution or to uh, its, its purported the founding US has documents. A, a very good constitution, in fact, a very simple, very concrete. Um, wh why, why hasn't it worked that way? Well, I think in, in some senses it has worked in that it's restrained things mm -hmm. and it, it's prevented 
uh, any one person necessarily from having too much power. So it, it, and, and we still have relatively robust speech rights, I, I think, in the United States. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a failure, but, it, but what, is, what is failing is just our own taste, our own appetite for having government as, as big brother and as the providing father and as the doting mother. And, and I think that that uh, is something that's just evolved over time. We've gotten away from, what the, from the American idea, at least as it was expressed in, in founding times. Is Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, a uh, libertarian, a conservative, a uh, liberal? What is he? he? I would call him a, a crony populist. Mm -hmm. He's someone who, who ap appeals to popular sentiment, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a tactic or a strategy. But he's, not, he's, he's someone who's really unmoored from any kind of ideological perspective. This is a guy who just wants results from his perspective, and he's not a guy who's interested in process so, or the rule of law or things like that. This is, this is a guy who could, be, who could be very dangerous, I think, in, in certain senses. Uh, and I think he's what, in a sense, he's what America deserves. If you look at our dysfunctional politics over the last 30 or 40 years, and all the wasteful spending and the, the foreign wars, um, it, it, and uh, in a sense, the hollowing out of the middle class because of mostly, in my opinion, because of government, I think in, in that sense, uh, we deserve him after the Bushes and the Clintons. Globalism or nationalism, what's best? Well, I'll take localism if I have to choose. Mm -hmm. I think that there are universal human precepts, and I think that there are things that, that we all want around the world that, that, that are universal human concepts. I don't believe in a universal political program. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in political globalism. I think, it's, I think it shows hubris mm -hmm. to advocate sort of Western social democracy for the world that this is what people need in Iraq, or this is what people need in Syria, or in Venezuela, I think that's very arrogant. And, and I don't agree with that. I, I, I think that what, what Mises talked about in, in terms of different nations was that what, what really makes an, an, a global economy is our differences, not our similarities. Some countries are, can produce automobiles better and cheaper. Some countries can produce uh, uh, cheap imported goods like China uh, better mm -hmm. and, and faster. A competitive so, advantage of competitive David, advantage. David Ricardo. Mm -hmm. Jeff Dice, president of the Mises Institute, thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you. Eh, y a usted, amigo televidente, que hace posible este programa, se lo agradezco también. Esto es todo por hoy, pero no se le olvide. Nos vemos la próxima.